My 12 New Steps for ACOAs, followed by a group discussion led by Tony Allen. Recorded live at the U.S. Journal Training and Changes Magazine sponsored 7th Annual National Convention on Children of Alcoholics. Held February 24th to 27th, 1991 in Orlando, Florida. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for getting up. Uh, as I was walking in here with a young lady, I uh, mentioned the fact that uh, at this particular hour uh, of my, my life, I feel that this hour is just about as important to me and to ACOA is the, uh, the hour that I first read the, uh, the laundry list. Uh, I look out in the room, and it's about the same amount of people that were in the room when I first read the laundry list. Yesterday I went into my personal story and uh, my AA and Al-Anon and ACOA experience. And uh, today what I'd like to discuss is uh, 12 New Steps for Adults, Children of Alcoholics, uh, why they were written, who they were written for, and uh, why I feel that the AA steps should be replaced. Uh, needless to say, this, this subject is not uh, uh, without some controversy, and uh, I have already uh, uh, been faced with that controversy. And uh, if I had listened to controversy at the beginning, ACOA never would have started. Because uh, if you look at the, uh, the superstructure or the structure of the 12-step movement, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is truly their parent. And uh, Al-Anon is, in many essences or many uh, uh, areas, the mother. And so along comes a movement, which is the children. And if you look at it, the alcoholic comes in, the alcoholic's anonymous. And they get sober. We get sober. I got sober. And I was told that all I had to do was to stay sober. And uh, I had a successful day. And the al -Anon person comes in. They're told to attend meetings, take the focus off their husband or wife, put the focus on themselves, learn how to detach, and they'd be okay. And this is terrific. And then all of a sudden, the ACOA movement starts, and these two parents have to look at what they did to the children. And needs to say, it makes them very nervous. Uh, uh, as an AA member, I, uh, I was living in, before I became an alcoholic, uh, recovering alcoholic, I lived in bars. I was never home. So my three children were brought up, and uh, I was never with them. So all of a sudden, I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. I got sober. I went out to help others. I went to a meeting every night. And uh, as my daughter said, I was running around helping strangers. And meanwhile, I had abandoned my family just as much with, uh, through, through, through AA as I had uh, uh, in bars. As far as my children were concerned, the only difference was I was now mouthing some slogans that they didn't understand, was talking about a higher power that they, I had never heard from me before, uh, whenever I happened to stop by at home. So as an ACOA, what I, I did was uh, I again abandoned my children uh, on an almost deeper level. Uh, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was presented with 12 steps. And these 12 steps uh, taught me that I had to clean up my act, uh, make amends, uh, admit to God, myself, and other human beings the exact nature of my wrongs, and go out and uh, uh, proselytize, go out and, uh, and uh, present the Alcoholics Anonymous program to others in order to help them. And I believe uh, all of that basically is a, is a wonderful, uh, wonderful tool for recovering alcoholics. Uh, I think that basically the uh, AA steps not only are not appropriate for adult children of alcoholics, I believe that the AA steps drive ACOAs crazy. And now I would like to launch into this discussion. Uh, I'm very good at incidentally telling my own story. I'm not so hot at this. Uh, I feel like uh, I'm sort of giving a lecture and I'm beginning to sound like an authority figure. And authority figures, as I say, scare the hell out of me. So 
So I'm beginning to scare myself. So if I sound too authoritarian, raise your hand and I'll try and stop. So I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to go through uh, these ACOA steps. Uh, first of all, in AA, I'll start off with the AA step. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol and their lives have become unmanageable. Well, as a two-year-old or a three-year-old, I really wasn't powerless over alcohol. I mean, I wasn't drinking it. Uh, it had no particular effect on me physically, except that the fact that my mother had drank it for the nine months that I was in the womb, which means I was almost practically, I guess, I didn't work out to be a total alcohol fetal baby, syndrome baby. Anyway, the step I've offered is we admitted that we were powerless over the effects of living with alcoholism and that our lives had become unmanageable. Now, what are the effects of living with alcoholism? I believe that's the laundry list that I wrote 78, which I will now read. These are the effects of living, having lived with alcoholism or a dysfunctional family. We became isolated and afraid of people and authority figures. We became approval seekers and lost our identity in the process. We are frightened by angry people and any personal criticism. We either become alcoholics, marry them or both, or find another compulsive personality such as a workaholic to fulfill our sick abandonment needs. We live life from the viewpoint of victims and are attracted by that weakness in our love and friendship relationships. We have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility and it is easier for us to be concerned with others rather than ourselves. This enables us not to look too closely at our own faults, etc. We get guilt feelings when we stand up for ourselves instead of giving in to others. We became addicted to excitement. We confuse love and pity and tend to love people we can pity and rescue. We have stuffed our feelings from our traumatic childhoods and have lost the ability to feel or express our feelings because it hurts so much. Denial. We judge ourselves harshly and have a very low sense of self-esteem. We are dependent personalities who are terrified of abandonment and would do anything to hold on to a relationship in order not to experience painful abandonment feelings which we receive from living with sick people who are never there emotionally for us. Alcoholism is a family disease and we became power alcoholics and took on the characteristics of that disease even though we did not pick up the drink. Power alcoholics are reactors rather than actors. Now those are the effects. That's my personality profile. That's what that's what happened to me as a victim, being brought up in an angry, abusive uh, atmosphere. Uh, sexually abused, uh, overtly, covertly, uh, uh, emotionally abused, uh, verbally abused, physically abused. And that is what happened to people, children brought up in that kind of an atmosphere. Uh, many of us became uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder victims, frozen feelings. Frozen feelings are, are, are uh, some of the effects of having been brought up in this kind of a home. Anyway, uh, also anger, of course, which is mentioned in here. Guilt, shame. But the basic uh, effect of having been brought up in that kind of an atmosphere is fear. I feel that I'm a fear-based person. Just about everything I've ever done has been based on fear. Uh, so anyway, uh, I believe I've covered the first step. The second step of Alcoholics Anonymous stated we came to believe the power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. When Bill Wilson was asked uh, what he meant by restored to sanity, he says, if I don't pick up the first drink, I'm restored to sanity. I agree with that. I think that's, uh, that's uh, certainly valid for, for, for members of Alcoholics Anonymous. But me as a member of, uh, of adult children of alcoholics, when I looked at the step, I skipped it. Uh, first of all, when I was an AA member, I looked at it and I said, gee, if they take away my insanity, there's no Tony. My whole life, I mean, uh, was, 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 uh, I was an insane uh, uh, person and I kind of liked it. You know, I was euphoric, up and down, did crazy things and, uh, and seemed to function at a pretty high level financially. I made a lot of money. Anyway, when I, uh, 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 how would I put it, when I helped get the ACLA movement started, uh, uh, one of the uh, members uh, came to me and said that the group had uh, uh, had a discussion and they asked me to write new steps for ACOA, which I did in 1979. 
about the 78 or 79, I wrote 12 Steps for Adult Children of Alcoholics, and uh, uh, some of these are included in these new steps, which I'm offering now. The uh, steps uh, at that time, I wrote them, and uh, a new member came into the ACUA movement who was a psychiatrist, and what I... Uh, asked him to do was to edit the steps for me so I could make it a we steps rather than just me. He did, and uh, the steps were in rather psychiatric jargon and uh, did not get too popular. They still use them some, some places in Brooklyn. I hear some, some, some places in, in California. But anyway, uh, if you look at the second step for an ACOA, we can't believe how great in ourselves could restore us to sanity. That's the AA step. Uh, restoration means to be given back something that I once had. If you look that up in the dictionary, that's what it says. And as an ACOA, as a child being brought up in, in, in a crazy, alcoholic, abusive family, there was no sanity. So there was nothing for me to be restored to. When I looked at this step from an ACOA basis, what, I, what, they, were, what I, they were saying was that basically uh, I would have to... Uh, uh, go back to the insanity of my family. That was all I had to be restored to. So the step I'm offering for ACOA is we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could bring us clarity. Clarity means clearness, clearness of vision, being able to see clearly. And there's one dictionary I looked up, and it said that uh, it can also mean freedom from guilt and freedom from shame. So it struck me that clarity is a, is a, is a far better uh, a condition for me to be restored to into uh, a sanity that I, I never experienced as a child. Uh, now, we come to one of the tougher problems, the third step of, of, of Alcoholics Anonymous stated that uh, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, as we understood it. Now, one of the basic problems for me as an ACLA is the trust issue. And I'd like to read something here that I got in a very, very spiritual book. And this has to do with the uh, spiritual beginnings of children who are, on this, who are hopefully all of us on a spiritual path. And this is the statement. Spiritual meanings progress in self-consciousness when the child transfers its ideas of omnipotence from its parents to God. The entire spiritual experience of such a child deep, depends largely on whether fear or love has dominated the parent-child relationship. Now, if that's the case, which I believe it is, <clears throat> in the home I was brought up in, and the homes that you all were brought up in, Fear was the dominant uh, feeling in that, in that family. And it was the dominant, uh, uh, compared to love, it was the dominant uh, uh, emotion that most of us were brought up in. That being the case, it means to me that on a feeling, on a feeling level, I cannot go any higher in trusting a higher power than I could trust my parents on a feeling level. And what were my parents? In my particular case, sometimes they loved me. They seemed to. And sometimes they, they, they uh, literally, verbally, or physically uh, uh, hurt me. So I could never depend on my parents to really do anything uh, consistent for me. So if I look at the AA step, what it seems to be doing for me as an ACLA is telling me to turn my will and my life over to the care of my parents as I understood them on a feeling level. <laughs> And since my spiritual uh, uh, experience can, no go, can go no higher in my, than the relationship that I had with my parents uh, regarding either fear or love, uh, I'm in somewhat trouble here. So the third step uh, that I'm offering for the ACOA movement is we made a decision to practice self-love and to trust in our higher power. And I'd like to read a little bit about from the step here. Instead of surrendering our lives to the sick parents that reside within us, we choose to put forth our faith in a spiritual power greater than ourselves, however we choose to define it. In my efforts to resolve the difficulties of my life, I recognize that I have to accept myself and learn to nurture myself. 
I found that I could no longer give myself away to the needs or demands of others. As difficult as it sounds for me, uh, trust, which is probably one of my most difficult issues, has to be basically a growth process. And it has to be an ongoing process. Trust for me is not an event. This higher power has to prove itself over and over again to me, almost on a daily basis, that it's guiding me, taking care of me, and that I mean something to it. Otherwise, uh, I need constant reassurance from my higher power. As a, uh, as a victim, which I believe we all are, and as a damaged victim, I need constant reassurance that there is something in the invisible world that loves me. And uh, the process, I believe, of these 12 steps are towards learning how to love myself and how to accept the love of this higher power. I'll go on with that in a minute. The fourth step of Alcoholics Anonymous says that we made a searching and uh, we made a searching and a moral inventory of ourselves. Is that it? We made a searching and moral inventory of ourselves. I feel this moral inventory of ourselves. Thank you. As a fear-based person, it's impossible for me to make a fearless moral inventory of anything. My whole life as a victim has been predicated on fear. Uh, somebody asked me, I was walking down the stairs, uh, to, as I was uh, coming in the room here, actually, in the book section, how I was feeling. And I said, well, uh, I'm extremely nervous uh, about this talk. I feel as it's probably the uh, most important talk that I've ever made uh, since ACOA started, other than when I read the laundry list for the first time. And I said, but what's the difference? I said, it really is not a heck of a lot more nervous or frightened than I am any morning that I'm getting up, because uh, uh, this is, is, has been my experience all my life. Fear has been probably my motivating factor. The last uh, 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 22 years of sobriety and the last, say, uh, what is it, since 1977, where the ACLA movement uh, started, uh, the fear has slowly diminished, but it isn't gone from my life. Anyway, the fourth step for adults and alcoholics is we made a searching and blameless inventory of our parents because, in essence, we had become them. I've been told that the adult children of alcoholics movement, I was, I was not in it for many years. I re remained in anonymity, so I wasn't out uh, uh, with, uh, you know, going to groups much. But I have heard that the, it's been said that the ACOA movement has been stuck in blame, blaming parents. That uh, you can go to some meetings and uh, they're blaming their parents, and uh, uh, three years later you go back and the same people are blaming the same parents. So that's an area where we've been stuck. In 78 or 9, I think it was, uh, uh, when I first uh, uh, sat down with these uh, steps, uh, I felt that there could be no recovery for me unless I made it a, 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 an inventory of my parents. Because I knew on many levels that I had become my parents and my stepmother. I knew that under certain uh, uh, conditions of stress that I would co become either my father or my stepmother. And uh, as I said before, that uh, one of the uh, glaring incidences was I was 10 years sober. I walked into a shoe store, and an older man, a very, very nice, kind man, bent down, and he started putting, fitting shoes on my feet. And I found that I was rude, angry, and abusive to this man. And uh, I got up and walked out, and I walked out in the street, and I said, my God, what's that all about? You know, I'm 10 years sober, and I'm abusing a perfect stranger. And it suddenly hit me. My stepmother was always abusive to shoe clerks and, clean, and, and cleaning establishment people. Always. And I found that uh, uh, when I was, as I would walk into a shoe store or a cleaning establishment, rage would start moving up in my stomach. And I suddenly realized under certain situations, I actually be, became and felt like my stepmother. I took on her actual being. Uh, I was sober about a year, and uh, I found myself limping out of a restaurant after I paid the bill. I said, my God, what's that all about? There's nothing wrong with my leg. And I looked back in my life, and I realized that my father always over-tipped in restaurants. He was a real people pleaser when it came to maitre d's and, and, and waiters. And I realized that I had felt that I hadn't tipped enough 
in that particular restaurant. And so in order that the waiter wouldn't yell at me, I started to limp so he'd feel sorry for me. And I realized I had started doing that when I was around 15 or 16. So as far as I could see, what I was in a restaurant was I became my father. And if I had, didn't become my father, what I did was I tried to get self, I tried to get pity so nobody would hurt me for not becoming like him. So I began to look at my life and I began to realize that uh, actually what I had I'd become was I had become my father. In many instances, I had become my stepmother and uh, the women that I was seeking out to have affairs with, live with, or marry, all looked like and were the mother that had, uh, had uh, had uh, disappeared in, from my life when I was two years old. So I later learned that we become one parent and we marry the other. So basically what I found out was that in order to have any type of forgiveness at all, I had to take a, a searching and blameless inventory of these parents and these people who had brought me up, uh, see what their positive aspects were and their negative aspects, look at them really from an objective viewpoint, look at some of the patterns of life that they used, look at some of the words that they used, look at some of the biasness they used. My father was, was Jewish, my mother was Christian, and my father was about as anti-Semitic as you could get. He hated being Jewish, and he didn't like Jews. And he taught me that I should never play with Jews, above all, I should never marry one, and that basically Jews were socially inferior to Christians, although they were intellectually superior. So in essence, I took on all those characteristics. One of the hardest things for me to do uh, is, is, is to, is to uh, basically uh, cut down on anti-Semitism because I became an anti-Semite just like my father. So it's one of the issues that I have to work on on a daily basis. So what does it really mean? Half of me looks at the other half with disgust. It's a wonderful way to be brought up. So, in order to forgive myself, I have to take an inventory of my parents and learn how to forgive them. In order to forgive them, I have to learn how to forgive myself. Hopefully, uh, the fourth step of ACLA, this new fourth step, will help the movement uh, 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 go through blame. I do believe the blame of parents is probably the first uh, healing process that ACOAs go through. I have to come in touch with the fact that although my head tries to forgive the abuse that was done to me, my gut basically, my little child within, is very, very angry and mad at these people. The fifth step, uh, we admit to God, ourselves, another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. That's the AA fifth step. Uh, I think that's fine for AA. I believe that uh, as an Alcoholics Anonymous, I was a perpetrator. I did wrongs to all kinds of people, including myself. I hurt people, I ran a rough shot over their lives, and uh, even prior to when I uh, picked up a drink, uh, I did wrongs to people. There's no doubt about that. But the 12 steps for AA are fine for perpetrators. Adult Tomb of Alcoholics, in my, in my belief, is Adult Tomb of Alcoholics was formed and created by my higher power and your higher power for victims, for little children, for people basically who were victimized were not, were not their perpetrators. So uh, the fifth step for ACOA is we admit it to our higher power, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our childhood abandonment. Abandonment is the core issue for people like us, that is our basic, that is what we live not to feel or experience. But the strange part about people like us is that that which we are frightened of feeling the most is what we are addicted to finding in our lives. In other words, abandonment is my major issue. It's the feeling I don't want to feel most of all. But what do I do? I'm addicted to finding abandoning types of relationships. So in order to realize this, in order to go through the process of basically finding nurturing relationships, I have to look at abandonment. And I'd like to read a little bit about what I've written here. Out of a searching and blameless inventory of our parents, we come to see how we reacted, adapted, revolted, resisted, and ultimately abandoned ourselves. 
When we review the nature of our parents' illness, we come to see how many of their behavior patterns replaced our youthful innocence and spontaneity. We see all the desperate adaptations, all the frightened defenses we built, all of the repression, frustration, and flight. Through these parent-taught mechanisms, we truly abandoned ourselves. All these harmful acquired behavior patterns we adopted are truly our childhood losses. We need to acknowledge that them to our higher power, to ourselves, and to another individual so that we can move toward a healthy self. The intent of this step is to help us recognize how we were emotionally abandoned as children and how we abandoned ourselves and became our parents. All right, I'll move on to six and seven. Six, we were entirely ready to begin the healing process with the aid of our higher power. And seven, we humbly asked our higher power to help us with our healing process. In this step, we ready ourselves to turn to a power greater than ourselves. No matter how hesitant or uncertain we may be about the wisdom of such a move, we should keep in mind that healing can and does take place in this world and is often propelled by acts of faith and belief. Here we are asked to open ourselves to the healing help of a spiritual force. This is part of the, the process on the road to trust. Seven, we humbly asked our higher power to help us with our healing process. This is a powerful step. It requires both humility and participation. Humility involves becoming aware that we really are not masters of the universe and that in all probability there is a divine order that we can tap into. Humility comes from the word humus, which is really of this earth. And I was told years ago that uh, what I needed to do was to become average in order to become humble. And I believe that's very true. I also feel that I have to go back in life and go back through the feelings that I experienced, the traumatic feelings, in order to find some sort of an authentic self. Uh, a prayer I used uh, years ago uh, when I was asked uh, by the AA program to look at so-called character defects and, uh, and shortcomings, and I learned a prayer for myself which I think is very applicable also to ACOA, and that prayer was, Please God, empty me of me and fill me with thee. Because I don't really know what I'm supposed to be emptied of as an adult child. I have no clue. I don't really know what my rights are, what my wrongs are. All I know is I hurt. I'm frightened of abandonment. I'm feeling pain, anxiety. Uh, I live my life with, uh, say, unshed tears. And I'm always on the verge of grief. Uh, it's better now. Uh, I can't say I'm over all of this. But in truth, this is what I would like to be emptied of. I would like to be emptied of, of, of these feelings of shame, guilt, and, uh, and fear, and terror, uncertainty, the desperate need to be loved in the external world because I'm unable to love myself. Uh, these steps were written uh, with the point of view that the goal would be self-love, learning how to uh, nourish love, care for me, my little child, and, uh, and basically be open enough then to receive the love of my higher power. Now, the eighth and ninth steps of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, deal with uh, amends. Now, as an AA member and as a perpetrator and somebody who did many wrongs to many people, I needed to make a list of these people, and I needed to make amends to them. In my AA experience, I found that when I wrote down the names of these people was the beginning of the realization that there was a higher power in my life which was actually making itself known to me on a daily basis. By taking a piece of paper and writing down the names of those people I had harmed and those people I had believed had harmed me because I found that they were interchangeable and then become ready to make amends to these people, I found within at least two days after having written these, this, this, this list, my higher power started bringing these people into my life in such a way that I could make amends to them. So I, believe, I found that writing was a, a, an incredible tool uh, which actually could create a connection between me and my higher power. That when I wrote things down, all of a sudden it gave my higher power a chance to become active in my life. So the eight to nine steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, the making of amends, 
It was an incredible uh, 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 spiritual experience for me. However, <coughs> as a member of the Adult Children of Alcoholics Movement, uh, I feel that uh, perpetrators should make amends. Grown-up people who marry perpetrators, such as al people, should make amends. Uh, children who have been <coughs> raped, incested, beaten, victimized, abused, do not have to make amends. Who too? And they certainly don't have to make amends to themselves. To themselves. So I would like to read a little bit from what I wrote here about the eight to nine steps for ACOAs. Eighth step. Uh, incidentally, uh, when I say I wrote, I'm offering these steps to the ACOA movement. Some of these steps came to me from outside sources. Some of them came to me through uh, 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 things I've read. So I'm not claiming authorship of, of, of these steps, two or three of them I am, but uh, I, I claim authorship of, of the laundry list. Uh, this is, uh, these 12 steps are something that I feel have been given to me over a period of years by a power greater than myself and from a power greater than myself. So anyway, eight, we became willing to open ourselves to receive the unconditional love of our higher power. Nine. We became willing to accept our own unconditional love by understanding that our higher power loves us unconditionally. In our alcoholic homes, we were the victims and our parents were the aggressors. As we internalized our parents, we became our own aggressors, unable to give ourselves anything but self-hate and self-criticism. Now we are willing to let go of the idea of ourselves as either victim or aggressor and open ourselves to the unconditional love of our higher power. As we open up, we are flooded with the warmth and love and acceptance we are denied as children. The infinite source of love is always available, available to us, waiting only for us to open the gates and let it in. <laughs> Around 1980, around 1979 and 1980, uh, I read a, uh, a book on the kahunas, the uh, medicine men or the wise men of Hawaii, and one of their spiritual practices, they believed that uh, on this level of experience, there's three of us. In other words, there's Tony that you see talking now to you all on this level, and there's you all on your level, and we're all on the same level together. About an inch above our heads was a higher power, and each one of us has an individual higher power, and that higher power is one with God. So my higher power, invisible higher power, is one with God, and your invisible higher power is one with God. And then down around this area in us is our little child. And as I was reading uh, this material, I began to realize that there was really some truth in this. Because every time I got hurt, every time I was abandoned, every time something seemed to go wrong in my life, I would get a pain in here, which was unbelievable. And I began to realize that in this particular area of my body seemed to reside a personality all of its own. The Hawaiians teach that in order for me to, uh, to achieve some sort of uh, spirituality, that I have to love this little child. So what I did uh, at the, the next day CLA meeting, I described what I just described to you, and I took my arms, and I shut my eyes, and I started hugging myself, and I started saying, I love you, little Tony. I love you, little Tony. I described that to the group, and I said, I believe this is probably the major way that, uh, that I will be able to achieve some sort of self-love. Uh, that night, I went home to my hotel room. I was living alone in a hotel, and I sat, and I hugged myself. I shut my eyes, and I visualized myself as a little child, two and a half years old, on my father's knee from a picture. And I started hugging myself, and I said, I love you, little Tony. I love you, little Tony. I love you, little Tony. I got to five, and I started sobbing. And I realized at that time that it was the first time in my life I had ever loved myself. And the Hawaiians teach that in order to, to, to love myself, I have to love this little child within me. Now, I don't know whether that was the beginning of the, uh, of, of the loving of the little child within or, or what happened. But apparently, uh, for me, that's when just about every day of my life, this morning before I came downstairs, I sat upstairs and I hugged myself. 
And I says, I love you, Tony. I love you, little Tony. I love you, Tony. I love you, little Tony. I want to love little me and big me <coughs> because I, uh, I figured we both needed it for this hour. Uh, and then I prayed and I said, please, God, help me to be your instrument in this talk. I believe that the reason probably I have been, uh, uh, been brought, brought out of anonymity is basically to present new steps for the ACLA movement. So from my viewpoint, as I say, this is probably one of the most important hours of my life. Uh, so anyway, uh, I believe that it's my higher power's job to love me unconditionally. <coughs> I also believe that this higher power cannot love me unconditionally until I love little Tony unconditionally. And as I love little Tony unconditionally, and I love him to the extent that he starts to become calm and accepting, then my higher power, his unconditional love, starts flowing through me <coughs> to him. And then we become a trinity. My higher power, me, and little Tony become merged in love, and as such, then we can be presented, basically, to home, or to the source, or to God. That's my personal belief. So my major spiritual job in life is to love this little person within me. Ten, we continue to take personal inventory and to love and approve of ourselves. As you can see, each one of these steps basically is on the road to love. Uh, I'm very, very good. I have been judge, jury, and executioner over myself all my life. Uh, there's no doubt that when this talk's over, I'll go upstairs and say, gee, you stupid son of a gun, you missed saying that. Hopefully, I will, will find that I won't have to do that. Uh, the tenth step in this daily action step incident uh, in this in this daily action step we monitor our actions and seek out those opportunities and situations where we can increase our self-esteem and self-love in other words look for the positives of what i've done today we can use these steps to correct our course in the event that we stray from healthy actions and be begin re reenacting destructive patterns of behavior if we see ourselves flirting with our contemplating or contemplating harmful behavior, it's important to recognize that change must come from within. We can ask our higher power for assistance, and we can turn to our group for support as we struggle with those actions that bring with them self-loathing, resentments, and guilt. We need to establish a new vigilance, one that centers on our behavior. This we can do by working this step on a daily basis, examining who we are, what we are doing, this day to grow and change. Now, the 11th step of ACOA is very similar to the 11th step of Alcoholics Anonymous. Instead of saying, uh, uh, you know, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with a higher power of our understanding. Playing, playing only for knowledge of its will for us and the power to carry that out instead of him, I made it it. And instead of using the word God, I used the word higher power. I must say I, uh, I did that because I feel that uh, it is a, I don't believe God's he, she, I believe it's it. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, prayer and meditation have, uh, have probably in the major uh, uh, step which uh, uh, saved my life. Uh, as I said, my first 11 months in Alcoholics Anonymous, my hands were sweating so bad that uh, from fear and terror, I really couldn't shake anybody's hand. My sponsor and I, uh, he took me over to Transcendental Meditation where I was initiated into the TM uh, discipline. And uh, the first day that uh, I was uh, taught to meditate, I was walking through Central Park in New York, and my left hand had stopped sweating. And I must say, at that particular time, I wondered whether it was the Jewish half of me or the Christian half, which had stopped sweating. Uh, I saw uh, from this experience that the meditation basically could change me physiologically, that uh, it could change my chemical makeup. 
I went back for the refresher course uh, two or three days later, and after that meditation, my right hand had stopped sweating. And I realized that the, the basically meditation was a way of changing me physiologically. And I began to, began to study all kinds of uh, uh, spiritual uh, 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 readings, and I got into uh, Western mysticism, Eastern mysticism. I found, discovered that Western mysticism basically seems to concentrate on the head. In other words, I see you as the Christ. Uh, uh, I love you. I, uh, I do a lot of mental work in order to try to become one with my higher power. Eastern mysticism, on the other hand, concentrates uh, mostly on the body. Their belief system states that there has to be a physiological ch transformation. That's rather, there has to be a physiological change in the body in order to affect a permanent spiritual transformation. In other words, the big book of, Al of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about God consciousness. And it talks about the overwhelming God consciousness which our, our early founders received. Bill Wilson had an overwhelming spiritual experience, as did Marty Mann have an overwhelming spiritual experience. Uh, most of us who came after those two people have had what is called basically an educational variety of spiritual awakening. My spiritual awakening has been going on and on and on and on, and I have not had that overwhelming spiritual experience that the founders of AA had. Uh, on the other <coughs> hand, uh, after Bill Wilson had this spiritual awakening, as did Marty Mann, uh, they tried to recapture it over the next 25, 30, 35 years, and uh, never could. In fact, I was at the meeting that Marty Mann spoke, and she said that she had just gotten over a 20-year depression. She had just gotten initiated in Transcendental Meditation. What I'm saying is that I learned that uh, in order to get myself aligned with my higher power, I had to give up caffeine. I had to get rid of smoking three to three and a half packs of cigarettes a day. I had to get off of sugar, uh, which I'm now five days off of again. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, that's been the toughest one for me, is sugar. I find it's a primary addiction. But God is calmness in action. Human beings are excitement in action. And I find that the drugs that I put into my body basically to create some sort of stress or excitement in me are those kind of obstacles to spiritual progress. I've learned that uh, prayer is talking to God, meditation is listening to God, and that the highest form of prayer is listening. When my mind stops, God's mind starts. The treatment uh, facility that was working with the indigent, and I ran a three-quarter house for indigent men, and the man who was my uh, my superior, how do you like that? Talk about authority figures. The man who was uh, oh, my boss said that uh, uh, he also had been initiated in the same trans in the same meditation uh, technique I had, transcendental meditation. And he felt that the people that we were working with were the lost souls, those who were coming in, who were living under bridges, those who had had 10, 15 treatments, those who uh, we were getting the cocaine whores, the, uh, uh, the uh, people with AIDS, and that uh, the only way that he felt uh, that possibly any of them could have some sort of a spiritual experience was almost right after they got clean, which was in a day or two. So uh, what I did was I, uh, I, I, I taught prayer and meditation to these people as soon as they came in. And what we were doing was we were offering the 11th step to the hopeless. And, uh, and so some of those people are still uh, sober today. So I found that uh, my job seems to be at the moment is that I, I teach uh, uh, meditation where I am. I, uh, I'm at a place called Renaissance in, 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 in Boca Raton. And Thursdays, what I do is from 6 o'clock to 6.30, I teach meditation to the public. And 6.30 to quarter of 8, I have an ACLA meeting, which, which I run. And uh, anyway, as I said, prayer is talking to God, meditation is listening. I was in an uh, in ashram, which is an eastern form of uh, the teaching center, which taught meditation. We meditated for hours. Uh, I was in an ashram. It was, uh, we had, there was, uh, I was in it. There was a man named Ram Das, and uh, he had an oath of silence. 
and this was in the uh, in the 70s. And uh, at this place, I learned that it was brahmacharya, which was basically with the celibate. And uh, I found that uh, uh, while I was doing all of this and uh, uh, working with things called kundalini energy, which is an energy which moves up the spine into the head, this was Eastern mysticism, that I, I, I was learning all different types of techniques of meditation, everything from breathing, basically, uh, to mantras. And I was fascinated with the subject. Uh, and strangely enough, uh, at this time in my life uh, was about the time that the uh, four young kids who started the ACOA movement uh, asked me to come. And I was going through all these spiritual exercises, going through all these spiritual concentrations. And through, at this period was when, uh, when I believe the laundry list came through me. So it all seemed to, to hang together. So anyway, prayer. The deepest form of prayer is listening. And when I listen, I hear the silence. And there was a book once written called The Thunder of Silence. And as I listen to the silence, the silence becomes God. Now, for adult children of alcoholics, the silence is a very threatening sound. Because the deeper I get into silence, what did silence mean in my household? There was always silence before chaos. So silence for me, in my sick background, puts me back into fear and terror. Because the deeper I get into it, the more I'm waiting for the explosion. The more I'm waiting basically for the terror and the horror of my childhood. So meditation for us becomes a deeper experience. It really does. Mm -hmm. While it's in my mind, I would like to, to, uh, to talk, uh, which I had forgotten, a little bit about abandonment again. It is true that abandonment is something that we've all suffered here. It's a ter horrendous feeling. It is a, uh, a gut-wrenching experience. And it's part of all of our lives. There isn't anybody in this room who, who has not suffered abandonment at deep, painful levels. I came across a teaching in the East, which states that those of, those of us of the human race who have not suffered abandonment at a very deep level cannot make the next level of spiritual awareness. In other words, abandonment is the passport to the next spiritual level. So those of us who have suffered abandonment, I would like to offer the proposition that in actuality, it's a huge spiritual plus. Because it's an emptying out feeling. And nature abhors a vacuum. And as I'm emptied out of humanness, my spirit can start moving into the God-shaped hole if I allow it to. That hole has always been filled up with people, places, and things for me. And if I can allow myself to feel the feelings, Stay empty. It allows this void to be filled up with spirit. And then the process comes, please God, empty me of me and fill me with thee. Somebody was, once asked, what, what is the Buddhist void? What does the Buddhist void feel like? And the answer came back, the Buddhist void is emptiness without fear. And that's hopefully what I hope to achieve in this lifetime feeling that emptiness and aloneness without the fear. <clears throat> you can hear my voice. That means I'm frightened. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be a day when I can describe that experience without the, without the fear. I, uh, have I covered <coughs> prayer and meditation? Hopefully. So I move on to 12. The Alcoholics Anonymous 12 Steps states that we need to go out having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps. Excuse me, that was the original. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to other alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. That's pretty self-evident. Now that I'm spiritually uh, more sound, I then go out and share this experience with other alcoholics, hopefully to bring them into Alcoholics Anonymous. I think that's wonderful for AA. But the 
at our Tulum Vakahawits, we have had a spiritual awakening as a result of taking these steps, and we continue to love ourselves and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Self-love and self-acceptance inevitably lead us to feel connected with the larger universe. When we were victims in an alcoholic household, we lost our, th our authentic self to the demands of the disease. Throughout our adult lives, and especially in ACLA, we have been attempting to recover and cherish our authentic, spontaneous self. Through working these steps to the best of our ability and developing a relationship with our higher power, we can gain a wonderful new awareness and an opportunity to truly change. We can find a happiness and contentment beyond anything we could imagine. This does not mean that our life will always be trouble-free, only that we can readily and constantly deal with life problems. There is a solution beyond ourselves. By working in the ACOA program daily and admitting we are powerless over the effects of living with alcoholism, we can learn to love ourselves. And when we do, we are free to love others in a new and healthy way. By sharing with each other, we act as a mirror reflecting our new growth and love. By using this program in all our affairs, we can dispel the old destructive personality that so crippled our enjoyment of life. No longer do we imitate a normal life, now we embrace it. So, it is my personal belief uh, that I'm here basically uh, by the grace of my higher power this morning to present uh, 12 Steps for Victims rather than perpetrators. It does not mean that sometime, if I'm new to ACOA, that after having done these steps and worked this program, uh, that it might not be a very positive act on my part to look at the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 step which is the same as, as, as Codependency Anonymous and the same as, uh, as, uh, as Al-Anon, and, uh, and, and make amends to people I had harmed. But as children, and that's what we're working on in ACLA, what I need to do is to put the focus on learning how to love me and not to blame and shame myself. Fear is what I am. I'm a fear-based person. ACLA is what I am, and codependency is what I do. And I feel my job, basically, is to help people learn about their personality profile. A very wise man, I think it was 400 BC, said that the way to do was to be. And what I believe the ACLA program and these steps will do is to help us learn how to be, along with the laundry list. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I was taught I had to be before I could, I had to do before I could be. I had to change my behavior in order to become something different. The ACOA movement is teaching me that I have to learn what I am. In other words, I have to be before I can do. So this morning, I've done my very best to be something, to be someone. And I hope this has been of, of, of some help to you. I know it's been some help to me. Uh, I... Uh, I know this is being taped, and it's my hope that this tape will get around maybe to the membership and maybe can be of some help. So well, I thank you very much, and I'd like to have a discussion. It's 8.30. I took up a lot of time. Yes, sir. I, I uh, honestly feel that, uh, that there should be no music in meditation. I believe that there's different levels of meditation. I believe music, water, is distraction. My personal belief is that what I am trying to do is to hear the still, small voice within me. And I'm trying to go beyond the mental level. So what I use, basically, is I relax my body. I relax my all the way up, and I count backwards from 10 to 0. I inhale, God, exhale, loves me. And as I get calmer and calmer, I then say, please, God, reveal yourself to me now. And I listen to the silence. 
as long as I can without a thought, even if it's just for one or two seconds. For those one or two seconds when my mind stops, I'm truly humble. My mind is not working. And I can then hear the silence. And the silence is God. For me to use anything else, music, water, is very distraction. But the most important part of that meditation is please God, reveal yourself to me now. And the moment of listening is when I can make the God contact. I'm not saying that whoever else's meditations are, they're perfect. I mean, I'm not, I'm just giving mine. I can't use, this is what I use. So I have been taught that anything other